I introduce Eric. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, I hope I will last because it's almost three in the morning for me. Uh, <laughs> but let's go. Okay, I want to talk about cognition as something we do. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to tell uh, or try to give some resume of, of the books which um, were mentioned by Simon, but I'll use some material to give uh, uh, a basic argument uh, which is present in the books, but there, there's much more in the books. Uh, and as Simon has asked me uh, to say something about art at the end, I'll come to that just a little bit. Good. Okay, let's start with the question, what is cognition? And that is a strangely ne neglected question. There was some mention of it uh, 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 before in, in the talks here, um, but it's still, uh, people use that word cognition all the time without uh, defining it. Uh, one element of cognition most people do uh, agree about is, 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 is present in it is that it somehow has to do with activity, with movement, with interaction and things like that. But it's, according to many people, just not enough. Cognition, for example, uh, writes uh, Martin Milkowski in a recent book explaining the computational mind, cognition is a narrower category than adaptive behavior. Otherwise, that means without relating to some kind of information processing, it is difficult to see how cognition should be possible for to repeat processes that play no role in the transformation or communication of incoming information would hardly deserve to be called cognitive. Okay, we have here the standard coupling of uh, the elements of activity, movement, interaction with an extra ingredient, which is uh, a standardly representation or information processing. And um, the idea that Cognition always in, invariably involves content, so it's definitional of cognition. That is what we have called in the book, Radicalizing and Activism, and also in its successor, we have called that kick or content involving cognition. Okay, now there are a, a, a number of motivations for why cognition must be defined that way, or why you must have that theoretical idea of cognition. Uh, and the very standard ideas that always re reoccur, reappear, uh, are that in the kind of activities, interactions, movements uh, that are relevant to cognition, well, we often deal with either the absent or the abstract, as Andy Clark and Josefa Toribio have famously uh, called it in a, a very influential article. Good. Now, what is the absent? The absent is simply that what is not immediately present in your environment. For example, the unseen side of a seen object is absent. Uh, or objects that are no longer there but are remembered, they uh, can play a role in cognition, yet obviously they are not in the environment, uh, so they must be represented somehow. Something must stand in, must represent these elements uh, when they play a, cognition, a role in cognition as they do. And the same goes for the abstract. The abstract also invokes the need for that uh, representational, infor informational uh, element in cognition. Uh, and why do we do, and, and how does an, that argument go? Well, it, it's, it's simply, it, it um, um, observes that we deal with things as instances of categories. When we encounter a particular instance of something, uh, we can show the same reaction uh, as to a previously encountered instance. So when I, when I uh, grab a, a cup, for example, uh, I, I, I have a general cup grabbing reaction and I can grasp cups of any size, of any form. They can be inverted. 
once I have this general capacity to grasp cups, uh, I deal with these cups in an abstract way, and my abstract way of dealing with them uh, uh, implies that I can uh, give the same reaction to an instance which I have never encountered as I have given to other instances. So that's how we deal, or, or we deal with the absent and the abstract, and how do we deal them with them? Well, we uh, uh, do that by uh, entertaining representations. They provide for what's missing in the concrete situation or stimulation, precisely by representing those absent features of reality and those abstract features of reality. Here's a very long quote from a paper by O'Brien and O.P., which was published in 2004, I think. I'll read it quickly to you. Instead of responding directly to the information impacting on its sensory surfaces, a creature can use it to construct internal models of the environment, onboard states that stand in for or represent external objects, relations, and states of affairs. These internal representations, rather than the information-laden signals from which they were constructed, can then be pressed into service to shape behavior. Such a decoupling of behavior from direct environmental control confers great benefits, since internal models of the environment can have a stability and definiteness that is lacking in the signals that impact on a creature's sensory surfaces. They also enable a creature to respond to features of the world that are not immediately present, to use past experiences, uh, to shape present behavior, to plan for the future, and in creatures such as ourselves, to be sensitive to, be, to very abstract features of the world. Okay, this last sentence clearly uh, expresses what I have indicated. We need these representations to uh, deal with the absent and abstract uh, features of the world. Okay, so from that kind of, of standard reasoning uh, about what um, 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 a cognition is uh, and why representation have to have to have, has to have a role in it, uh, uh, there comes a, 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 a big scientific agenda for cognitive science. Uh, uh, it implies a, a great research program. Well, you have to identify those representations and you have to put them to explanatory work. Okay, and here's an example. Here's a concrete example. Stanislas Dehane, the neuroscientist on numerical abstraction. Uh, well, he's concerned with uh, numerical cognition uh, and he notices or he uh, notices that there are experiments in which it's shown uh, that both animals and uh, humans, ch children, <clears throat> that they can recognize uh, uh, three uh, visual objects or three seen objects as belonging to the same category as three uh, uh, seen apples. So they can have the same reaction to uh, st these seen stimuli. But interestingly, and there are further experiments that show that, they can uh, trans have, uh, there's a phenomenon of modal transfer in that uh, 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 those animals or uh, humans also transfer that capacity uh, across modality. So animals who uh, uh, can also show the same reaction to tree tones. Okay, okay, also when in a different modality, it's, it's three that is uh, shown they will show the three reaction and the seven, eight, whatever reaction, same numerical reaction. Now, Dehane uh, uh, writes about this in a paper of 2011 on the, on the book. The simplest explanation is that the child really perceives numbers rather than auditory patterns or geometrical configurations of objects. The very same representation of the number three seems to fire in its brain, whether it sees three objects or hears three sounds. This internal abstract and immodal representation enables the child to notice the correspondence between the number of objects in one slide and the number of sounds that are simultaneously heard. Good, so you have those uh, representations which are there and they play a very important uh, uh, 
explanatory role is because this representation is activated, so the Hane claims. It's because this abstract representation is uh, uh, activated that uh, it is able to uh, uh, show the abstract reaction to transfer across modalities. Not so fast, uh, we would say, however. Before you can make these claims, uh, you have to answer some questions. In the first place, you have to answer the questions, what do you precisely mean by representations? It's the first question. And secondly, you have to answer the question, how do these representations come to represent? The first answer is relatively easy. There are all kinds of definitions of representation, but uh, there is also a, a great consensus on uh, uh, what representations are. Uh, there's an intuitive notion at play. Representations are things that tell things, that describe something. Uh, sometimes it's said that they portray something, they portray the world. Uh, in other words, they have truth or accuracy conditions. They, there are conditions of the world which they represent and they can represent those, those features truly or, truly or falsely. They can uh, 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 be accurate or inaccurate with respect to how the world really is. That's a standard definition or a standard conception of representation. It also implies that representations uh, represent as, they represent things in a certain way. If you describe something, if you portray something, if you uh, uh, um, make a statement about something, you have to have some kind of medium in which you make that statement, so you have to uh, represent it as, in a certain way. So, I take it that this is a fine definition of representation. And, and we have taken in the books, we have taken this as uh, uh, definitions of representation which we were using and we think they are in line with uh, the use in much of the cognitive science and philosophical literature. There are of course other definitions of representation. You're free to define representations as you want. But from now on, I'll only be dealing with this kind of definition. Uh, and as I said, I think it's fairly standard. Okay, now the second question is harder to, um, to answer. And that's the question, how do those representations come to represent? How do those things which have those representational properties have acquire these properties, or how do they carry these properties? How are they able to describe, portray the world, make statements about the world, etc.? That's a more difficult question. Now, it is a solvable problem for one kind of representations, or so we claim in the book. And these are the representations of language. These are the declarative <laughs> sentences of language, the sentences in which we make, with which we make statements like now it's evening or it's raining, etc. We can solve the question or the, the question of how these representations come to have their representational properties by telling a natural history of how they have come to acquire those properties. Uh, and that will be a natural history uh, of how truth-telling practices have occurred. Truth-telling practices are practices in which, uh, which we have evolved in language, uh, uh, most uh, particularly, uh, in which we come to make statements which can, can uh, uh, be assessed as true, as false. Uh, uh, once, and we, in order to do that, we need to have developed a language, we need to have developed uh, communication, and we need to have developed 
the idea of truth, the idea that someone can say something which can be true or not, depending on how the world is. Uh, and we have developed the notion of uh, truth, even in a sense in which uh, truth is independent of all what we think truth is, uh, 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 truth uh, in these truth-telling practices uh, is, a, is, a, is a normative idea which guides a lot of those practices. Now, if you, if you think uh, about it in the context of language, you have a wide and rich range of resources to start your explaining why this property has occurred. You can uh, 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 refer to social interaction and group, group forming, cooperation, specific interaction, uh, some processes which have stabilized some practices because they were useful, et cetera, et cetera. And you can uh, uh, at least sketch a story or see how such, see that it is plausible that you can uh, 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 come to a story to how all those elements finally give rise to truth-telling practices and to things in language we can do, which can do uh, representing as namely the descriptive sentences of language. That's all fine. No problem for, no problem for <laughs> linguistic representations uh, uh, like sentences in natural language. But what if you think about representation in a different context? What if you think about representation uh, in the way that kickers think about representations, namely as things which occur in the brain even before we evolved language, before we developed language, and which probably uh, are, inv are involved, according to kickers, in the development of language. Well, uh, um, if you uh, ask the question how those come to represent, you have to have to tell another story than the one you have told for uh, language. And this telling, uh, this problem, telling this story is much harder because the rich resources which I uh, talked about in one of the previous slides are not available, it's not available. You can't uh, talk about the development of language when you're talking about that kind of representations. Of course, you have other means, uh, and philosophers who have uh, tried to give uh, accounts of how those kinds of pre-linguistic representations uh, represent uh, have used these. You have, for example, natural covariance relations, hmm? uh, relations in which something in the brain, for example, covaries with something which happens in the world, hmm? what in, within the world that causes the, uh, for example, causes what's in the brain. Uh, you can talk about biological functions. You can add that to the covariance relations. You can think of things in the brain which covary with things outside in the world. Uh, and those things in the brain might have functions of guiding behavior towards what causes them, etc., etc. You can have other means. You can fill in uh, this as you want. Well, not as you want, but <laughs> there are other possibilities and, and, and philosophers have used other possibilities. Whatever, um, and I'm not going to give detailed arguments, there is now a, there is a widely shared verdict that not one of the attempts to build an account of content with, uh, uh, of representational content by those means I have just uh, indicated, uh, none of them, none of these uh, attempts have been successful. Uh, it hasn't been possible by those means to explain the having of truth conditions for those representations, the ability to make statements for those representations, or the ability to represent as. In the first book, we focused a little, uh, somewhat on, well, we focused, uh, no, there was some focus on the idea, for example, that covariance doesn't constitute content. That's, that's, 
relations of covariance between brain events and artery events can be of help in attuning an organism to its environment, but that doesn't amount to content. If something in your brain covaries with something in the outside world, it doesn't thereby carry content, doesn't describe, doesn't uh, cause other things because it uh, describes or makes a statement. And we've also argued that adding function does not change that. If you add function, um, uh, you still don't have content, you have adaptivity, but that's not yet content. There are uh, uh, many uh, people who have expressed the same idea, and I give you two, two quotes here from uh, f well, famous analytical philosophers. Tyler Birch writes, there's a root mismatch between representational error and failure of biological function, okay? So, uh, a, 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 okay. Um, um, in other words, the kind of, 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 of uh, non-functional behavior, a neuron, a correlating rep neuron in the brain can give rise to, that, that malfunction, that isn't uh, the same as carrying a false content. A similar remark is from Kriegel. The naturalizing intentionality research program bears all the hallmarks of a degenerating research program. It has run up against principal obstacles it seems unable to surmount. Far from being technical, the problems just mentioned are fatal. Okay, this is saying with those limited resources uh, kickers have, you can't concoct a theory of content. And we agree with that. Okay, you might say, no theory of content, but still we need our contents or our representations for so many explanatory purposes. Because if you throw away the representations, you lose so many explanatory means. It's simply impossible to explain cognition without representations. Okay, to give you a concrete example, let's return again to Stanislas de Haan's number story. Transfer uh, from different kinds of objects in one modality plus intermodal transfer of number related reactions. Well, remember what uh, uh, the Han said, the simplest explanation, the child perceives the numbers rather than auditory patterns or geometrical configurations of objects. Okay, and then there's a, whoops, there's a, oops, sorry. And then there's a, an internal representation that gets activated when the intermodal transfer becomes possible. And it's because this internal abstract or amodal representations gets activated that the child is enabled to notice the correspondence between the number of objects on one slide and the number of sounds that are simultaneously heard. Okay? The idea is that you must have this abstract representation because your contact with Concrete objects is only uh, concrete. You must add this abstracting. And once this abstracting is, is added, you get the abstract um, capacity. Okay, that's the logic. Contact with auditory patterns, geometrical, func ge geometrical conf configuration is in itself can't give rise to a general reaction. So the emergence of the general reactions needs to be mediated by an internal abstract representation. But there are some problems with this thinking. First problem is what uh, in a paper with Karim Zahidi uh, and myself, we have named the problem of origin. And that's a problem of how that abstract amodal representation arises in the first place. Okay, contact with auditory patterns or geometrical figurations isn't sufficient to lead to a general capacity. 
you need an abstract representation to mediate that. But how can the abstract representation itself then arise? There's only contact with geometrical configurations and auditory patterns. And if that's not sufficient for the general capacity, why would it be sufficient for the abstract concept or the abstract representation? Wouldn't you, by the same logic, which was, which was uh, used to invoke the need for an abstract representation, uh, need an extra mediating abstract representation again, and so at infinitum. Okay, you could perhaps say, well, these representations are innate, but does that really help? If it's innate, it's the product of a selective process, selective evolutionary process, and a selective evolutionary process, how would we explain that? By contacts of uh, uh, organisms with concrete events, concrete things. Now, if by the reasoning that was previously engaged in, contract with concrete things like geometrical shapes never suffices to get these abstract uh, representations, evolution can't do the job either. So if you're reverting to innateness, you have to <coughs> accept some kind of evolutionary unexplained innateness. Notice that's quite close to position of, of people like Chomsky and Fodor. And it's, it's, it's only logical that you should end there if you invoke those abstract representations. Second problem, problem is what we call in that paper, problem of substance. Well, how does the firing of an abstract representation enables the child to see to acquire the general capacity. What's the mechanism? How does this abstract representation, which is some specific neural firing, a concrete neural firing in the, in the head of the child, how does that enable it to acquire that abstract capacity? How does that infuse its abstractness into the child? What's the mechanism there? Mechanisms will always be concrete things. There's, besides this problem of origin, a second problem of substance. We're told nothing about how that uh, uh, happens. The thing to conclude from that is that, well, the abstract concept that is invoked by the Hana seems quite superfluous. There's, and the proper uh, um, conclusion seems to be that well, perhaps there's nothing more to making an abstraction than acquiring the capacity to go on in the same way. The abstraction is the process of reacting now in the same way to something not previously encountered as in the way we, um, we reacted to something previously. And once that uh, 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 it's not needed to invoke something standing outside that capacity uh, as emerging and as being a causal driver of that abstraction. Once the capacity uh, shows itself in, in correctly reacting, everything is done. We don't need something, we don't need, uh, that is the abstraction, we don't need to uh, uh, assume there's something that stands outside of it, behind it, and which causes it. Of course, some <coughs> explanation is needed when we do such things as acquiring a general reaction, acquiring a general capacity. But what is needed, what, what, what suffices if the previous reasoning uh, is uh, correct, is precisely this history of interaction between concrete things. And of course, some things will change, perhaps in a neural net, in, 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 in neural networks or in the brain, some whatever uh, uh, 
connections will change or some other change. Uh, and as a result of that, <clears throat> the general, uh, 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 from then on, the general capacity is acquired. Uh, but that's not the acquisition of an abstract concept which causes the acquisition of the general capacity. Moreover, as a, a side note, changes might just happen in the environment. You might acquire a capacity just because, because some change happened in your environment rather than in your brain. Think about the proverbial knot you make in your handkerchief and which makes you remember something. Okay, so if that all is true, uh, it is true histories of interactions, uh, or we have to refer to histories of interactions to account for uh, the important thing, namely that organism becomes sensitive to patterns that matter for the interactions that matter, as Andy Clark has recently written it in his book, uh, Surfing Uncertainty. But it's not necessary at all that those patterns that matter for the interactions that matter are represented in any way. We just have to become sensitive to them, probably through some changes internally or externally. Okay, you can uh, 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 um, um, return to the example of the cup you have Encounters with many cups. Uh, you, you, uh, uh, um, and initially, you might not have the general capacity in that you can't grasp all of them. But after enough contact with them, uh, and probably changes within, you're able to grasp any one of them. Now, backside of the apple, you've seen very many apples. Um, um, you're, you're familiar. With that the pattern of the apple is one in which there's a backside. Um, uh, you've become adept to that through your many encounters of them. Uh, and so that in, 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 in many instances, you, which, or in the instances in which you only see the foreside of it, you're adapted to the pattern that it has a backside and you will react to it as if it had a backside. Same, of course, for our numbers. You don't need that uh, abstract concept. I've already uh, um, explained that. Okay, so notice uh, that through this uh, uh, sketchy, I certainly uh, uh, admit, through this uh, sketchy story, we are able to get in touch with the absent and the abstract without any representational content. Okay. What happens is that we acquire capacities, we change our interactions based on our previous interactions, but we don't uh, in any way represent <coughs> the absent or the abstract. We don't represent the backside of the apple. Uh, we don't represent the number when we react uh, in the same numerical way to things of the same quantity. Okay. Notice, and that's important, and that's <clears throat> notice that our, this process is response or action dependent. What gets lumped together as requiring the same reaction, that depends on the kinds of responses we can make, we can undertake. Why do we recognize three uh, uh, in, in, in various instances, well, because the same tree-like <laughs> reaction uh, or, or, or tree-adapted reaction uh, uh, is, 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 is uh, appropriate in that situation. Uh, why do we react to the apple to, uh, as having a backside? Well, because doing so is uh, uh, an appropriate response. Okay, but if that's all true, then it is so that rather than um, that we resonate to some pre-given structure of the world, 
um, um, we become sensitive to the things which allow certain actions or which have certain connections. Uh, it's very much like affordances. It's very much un. It's very much unlike the idea of sort of platonic properties which are already there in the world and which we hit upon and which we then mirror by our representations. Now, of course, there are always many patterns at once which we are sensitive to. Different time scales, uh, different spatial scales, and organisms are doubtlessly able to become sensitive to all these levels at once. When I, when when you hear a, or when you say or when you say something in a conversation, uh, you are sensitive to the situation you are in. Is it is it an exam? Is it uh, are you on a bus? You are sensitive to the conversation you might be having with someone. You are sensitive to the previous sentence you've said. You're you're sensitive to the Wor previous words you have said, etc., etc. You're sensitive to a structure at, at many scales at once, um, uh, and you're uh, showing a reaction which spans in this current moment all these scales at once. And I also want to add that there is some kind of within level nestedness, so one can become sensitive to some patterns because they lead to not an immediate possibility for action A, but because it creates further patterns which create a possibility for further action. So we can uh, pick up on patterns which only indirectly can give rise to actions, and that can be repeated many, many, many steps down. Okay, so an example discussed by Dreyfus, also by uh, Rietveld, uh, a boxer uh, will choose not, um, will not strike whenever the opponent uh, is, is, or whenever, whenever he's in the match, but a boxer will also seek the position from which he can strike and seek the position from which he won't be uh, struck by its opponent. Okay, so you, there you have this leveled uh, 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 nestedness uh, of uh, reactions at work. Okay, if all that's right, uh, and we look back at the kick conception of cognition, uh, we have given arguments that you you can't have it. You can't have those pre-linguistic, pre-social representations which you would need if all cognition was uh, representational. And I, I've given arguments, or the argument, yeah, in a, especially the argument concerning the Han, that you don't need those representations, at least in that case. And as a result, if we go back to what I said at the beginning, uh, if the idea was that cognition was something we do plus this representation element, and if you now have to strip away that representation element, what, le what this leaves us with is that cognition is something we do true and true. And the way we cognize has an unbreak unbreakable link to what we do and can. Here's a consequence, and I'm almost ending, and now I make my link to art. <coughs> so if what we can do is open-ended, cognition is open-ended. There are no preset boundaries on cognition. It's not a platonic. Uh, uh, abstract things which are there, which we have to pick up that determine what cognition is. Uh, there are no boundaries deriving, for example, for the nature of representation. Okay, now I can make my link to art. Cognition is open. Art 
is open-ended par excellence. For the very same reason as cognition is, uh, open uh, is, is something we do, it also is something we do. It's not constrained by some pre-given nature, such as representing things. There's no thing such as Danto's end of art. Art can always develop in different ways, depending on the ways we interact with the world, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea of the end of art is bad. That's the end of the talk. <laughs>